stunning scenery, relaxing onboard venues, but a nightmare four-hour embarkation, long lineups for everything, and glacier visit canceled. Join me as I explore the highs and many lows for my Alaska cruise on Majestic Princess out of Vancouver. Hey cruisers, Andrew from Ottawa, Canada here. Welcome to one of the first episodes of The Chill Cruiser, where I review premium cruise ships from a chill perspective, sharing tips and tools on how to save time, money, and grief on your cruise vacations. What do I mean by chill? I'm talking about things like food, wine, the spa, casino, and entertainment on cruise lines like Celebrity Princess and Holland America, which explains why you saw me enjoying a half-empty glass of delicious Alaskan beer on Mount Roberts a few seconds ago. Cruising is awesome. You just can't beat the experience. I mean, that's your view every morning. But planning a cruise can get complicated between the destination, the cruise line, the ship, the itinerary, the cabin type, flights, rental cars, hotels, excursions, insurance. You have to make hundreds of decisions by the time your vacation's over. Each of those decisions and how you pay for them can have a big impact on the value and quality of your experience. I've been really fortunate to experience more than 30 cruises with most of the major lines, and I've learned a lot along the way. Including most recently that I need a new cruise wardrobe, but that's another story. My goal is to share what I've learned to help make some of your decisions easier. I'll also post the daily program and food and drink menus for each cruise on my blog to give you a better idea of what it's like on each ship. I've learned how to save several hours of time waiting in airport lines and several hundred dollars every time I cruise, and I want to help you do the same. On this particular cruise, I saved much more than that since my cabin was comped by the casino. How I did that without breaking the bank is one of the many topics I'll cover in a future episode. So if you're new to cruising or just curious about to up your cruising game, please subscribe to my channel so you don't miss any intel. Okay, let's start with what I learned on my Alaskan cruise on Majestic Princess this past May, starting with the port of Vancouver. The good news is that Vancouver is a stunning city and the port is a quick train ride away from the airport. It's also located downtown, which makes it easy to experience all the city has to offer, including the beautiful Capilano Suspension Bridge Park. Check out my video about this must-see experience here. Okay, so one of the bad news about the port of Vancouver. Both times I've cruised out of there, it's been a complete gong show. This time it took close to four hours of standing in line, standing in line to check in, go through security, and get cleared by US Customs. Princess shares some of the blame for letting thousands of people come to the port at their scheduled check-in time, even though the ship had arrived five hours late. If you're planning a cruise out of Vancouver, don't miss this video with eight things you really need to know before embarkation day. The embarkation nightmare and how Princess handled it was a sign of things to come, but more on that later. Let's talk about the ship itself. Majestic is a fairly new Royal class ship, meaning it shares the design and most of the amenities of sister ships Royal, Regal, Sky, Enchanted, and Discovery. It's a beautiful ship that's perfect for Alaska. It has more space available to all guests than the other Royal class ships because they replaced the four feet sanctuary at the front of deck 17 with an indoor observation lounge that's free for all guests. They also converted what's usually an outdoor pool in front of the sanctuary into a solarium style pool area with a retractable roof. The casino is larger and connected to a plush sports bar and lounge. They significantly expanded the amount of space dedicated to high-end shops. The Italian specialty restaurant was replaced with an Asian restaurant. They replaced the usual pizza kiosk on the Lido deck with a noodle bar and added several outdoor pinball courts. On my cruise, they had also just converted the French restaurant to a seafood restaurant called The Catch by Rudy. As with all princess ships, Majestic offers the medallion experience, which means just wearing this medallion lets you do pretty much everything on the ship, including accessing your cabin, gambling on slot machines, ordering drinks at the bar, and having food and drinks delivered to wherever you are on the ship using the Princess app, which is really cool. So here's Majestic at a glance from a chill perspective. It's a larger ship with capacity for 3,500 guests and 19 decks. On my cruise, it was sailing at close to capacity with around 3,000 guests on board, and you could feel it every day in places like the buffet and the main dining rooms. More on that later. Majestic has seven restaurants total. The three main dining rooms and pizza restaurant are included, and then there's three specialty restaurants, Asian, steak, and seafood. There are 11 bars, one focused on wine and another focused on high-end cocktails. There's three pools, two outdoor and that one solarium pool with the retractable roof, six hot tubs, four outdoor and two in the solarium, a thermal suite available for an extra fee with hydrotherapy pool, two steam rooms and a sauna, more on that later. 
there's a decent sized casino with 140 mostly big name slots and 10 tables. There's three theaters on board, one large traditional space for production shows and guest entertainers, one smaller theater used mainly for activities like trivia and game shows, and a cocktail lounge space that was mainly used to show movies. There's also more than seven shops and boutiques, which is where I got the princess merch that I'm wearing right now. Before I start my review, I should clarify that my opinions are based on the goal of a relaxing vacation, with an emphasis on the ship. So chilling during the day in between port activities, a nice meal at night, mixed in with a bit of fun in the casino theater and the disco. I've sailed on almost all of the major lines, including Carnival, Holland America, Norwegian, and Celebrity, with eight cruises on three of those lines since the cruising restart in 2021. Based on that experience with Princess and the other lines, I do have high expectations that the cruise lines have set, but the perspective of a first-time cruiser or someone who's only sailed Princess would obviously be very different. Whenever I have constructive criticism compared to other Princess cruises or lines, I'll give a bit of detail so you can decide for yourself whether it's an issue for you or not. Okay, let's get started with my review, which I'll break down to 10 categories. It's a big shit with a lot going on, so there's 10. Let's start with access. The cruise got off to a really bad start with the four hour embarkation process, but that was only the beginning of many lineups throughout the cruise. There was an awkward gangway set up at most ports that caused large bottlenecks getting on and off the ship, which meant lineups of five to 10 minutes to get off the ship and between 15 and 30 minutes to get back on the ship, depending on time of day. We seemed to dock in the furthest berth to each port, so you also had to line up to get to shuttles into most of the towns we visited. In Juneau, the ship docked about one mile from the city, so you could either walk or again line up for a free shuttle. In Sitka, the ship docked several miles from town, so we needed to line up with passengers from the other dock ship for a free shuttle. So even though we were docked in every port, we lost the same amount of time as tendering. If you're planning to explore ports on your own, budget around one and a half to two hours for each port to get on and off the ship and shuttle into town except for Ketchikan, where you walk right off the ship into the town. Luckily, disembarkation was smooth, and it only took a few minutes to get off the ship and out of the terminal. Let's move on to the vibe of the ship, which is classic princess, meaning very traditional golden brown everywhere with the grand three-deck piazza serving as the hub of the ship. Indoor spaces look very elegant, but a bit stuffy. Almost every venue looks and feels the same. Most of the spaces are designed with small bars and massive seating areas, which is great if you want to sit and chat with your companion or group, but not so great if you're traveling solo or like to socialize like me. It's definitely a lot more relaxed and open on the top decks with the solarium pool and lounge and the seawalk, which is a cool glass bottom walkway cantilevered off the ship. In terms of layout, I find Royal class ships difficult to navigate. There are dead ends everywhere, so you constantly have to turn back or go up and down a deck to get where you want to go. Even though I've been on this class of ship four times, I still ended up going down the aft stairwell to the isolated Allegro dining room at least once a day which means to get to the other amenities on deck six, you need to go up to deck seven, walk half the length of the ship, and then go back down. This is a common quirk on Princess and Carnival ships, but not necessarily Celebrity, Royal Caribbean, or Norwegian, where almost every hallway seems to flow from bow to stern to get where you want to go on most decks. Every time I used a stairwell to get to my cabin's deck, I could never tell which side was odd or even, or which direction my cabin was in, because there was often no signage. Although the complex with the solarium pool and observation lounge is beautiful and takes up a quarter of the deck, there's no elevator or stairwell access, so you have to go to the midship stairwell and through the outdoor pool deck to get in. The entrance also doesn't have automatic sliding doors or an automatic door opening button, so it's not as accessible as it should be. Several spaces on the ship also feel claustrophobic. The buffet is a series of narrow corridors between two seating areas, which can feel a bit chaotic at times, especially when the ship is close to full like on our cruise. It's a strange point, but considering the attention paid to the other public spaces on the ship, they completely ignored the public bathrooms, which were mostly very tight and claustrophobic when they're usually large and fairly luxurious on other lines. Like other Royal class ships, Majestic doesn't have much of a promenade, and it can be tricky to find if you're looking for some fresh air on the lower decks. Okay, let's talk about cabins. My standard balcony cabin was very comfortable and exactly the same as other Royal class ships, with a large open closet and a very comfortable bed. Balconies on Royal class ships are some of the smallest out there and offer about half the amount of standard space than Celebrity and Hall in America, but there is enough space for two to sit on an angle. The bathroom is also smaller than most other cruise lines, but still practical with the infamous princess shower curtain and awkwardly positioned toilet paper holder. The on-demand entertainment system has a great selection of TV shows and movies, including every episode of The Love Boat. Interior space increases as you climb up cabin categories, but unfortunately decreases for ocean view and interior cabins by as much as 50 square feet. 
If you're researching cabins, note that the cabin diagrams on the Princess website exaggerate the amount of space. I guess they're in denial about those shower curtains because the diagrams suggest the showers have glass walls, but I digress. Moving on to food. Room service was great and it's still mostly free. Considering this is an area that other cruise lines have cut and added fees, you can still order a great variety of food all day for free, including burgers, sandwiches, salads, quesadillas, and desserts. I called room service several times to order breakfast in the morning, which is usually prime time and means long waits, but my order still arrived within 15 minutes. The fast food available on the pool deck was also very good. Chopsticks offers a few delicious noodle dishes, but surprise, you have to wait in another 15 minute line. On the other side, you can get burgers, fries, and tacos with less of a wait. I don't have many positive things to say about the buffet. Although they usually had a great antipasto spread in the evenings, I found most of the prepared foods in the buffet loaded with way too much butter, cheese, and mayo, and I didn't enjoy most of what I tried. Same with Alfredo's, their free pizza restaurant. I ordered a margarita pizza, and after waiting 45 minutes, I got whatever this is with way too much cheese. I think it's a 15 cheese special. Let me know what you think. Their international marketplace located on deck five of the piazza is a very convenient way to get coffee or snack without having to go up to the buffet. It has a large selection of sandwiches and desserts, but if you're looking for something without a lot of bread or sugar, you're usually out of luck. Let's talk about the main dining rooms, which is an area Princess is really struggling with these days. They recently eliminated the option for traditional set dining times, which means the entire ship can try to get dinner at the same time, and that's how it felt the first few nights with long lineups to get a table. Unlike other cruise lines, Princess doesn't offer beepers so that you can relax at a bar or lounge while you wait. You just have to line up and wait. On the third night, I stood in a lineup like this of about 50 people for 30 minutes before finally getting a table in a very loud dining room. You can make reservations in advance, but you still need to wait for a host to seat you. So here's a tip. Even though there's technically three main dining rooms, there are actually four staffed entrances. If you see a lineup in one entrance, check out the three others. Let me walk you through it. Okay, so starting on deck five, we have the symphony dining room, which has two entrances on either side of the ship. Moving up to deck six, the infamous Allegro dining room. There's one entrance in front of the stairs and the elevators like you saw in that picture. And then moving to the mid part of the ship of deck six, there's only one entrance on the starboard side available to all guests. The one on the port side is only for reserve collection guests, which is the suites. You got that? Remember what I told you about the layout. You'd think if they created a separate dining area for certain guests, they would just create a separate restaurant like all of the other cruise lines have done. So there's almost no mistaking that the restaurant is not available to everyone, but I digress. Once I did get a table, the food was pretty good. The main dining room menus offer a nice selection, including several local Alaska seafood options. Check out my blog if you'd like to see the dinner menus for each night in the main dining room, as well as all the specialty restaurants. They have noticeably reduced the portion size, which isn't necessarily a bad thing, but I do think they're getting a bit carried away in some cases. This was a pork ribs entree, but it looked more like an appetizer. In Crown Grill, the steakhouse specialty restaurant, I ordered asparagus as a side dish, and this is how it came, three small strands. The steak was good though. The portions were also small, but tasty in the Asian restaurant Harmony. I highly recommend the lemon chicken, which was so good and small, I had finished it before I remember to take a picture. I don't eat seafood, so unfortunately I can't give you my take on the seafood restaurant. I'm not gonna lie though, even though I tried two of the specialty restaurants, there weren't any wow dishes that impressed me. The most memorable meal I had my entire vacation was actually this meatball appetizer I had at the restaurant at Capilano Suspension Bridge Park in Vancouver, which obviously has not reduced portion sizes. Moving on to the drinks category. Anyone who knows me is probably smiling right now because they know this is a favorite topic for me. Every bartender or server was super friendly and fast. Even with an almost full ship, you never had to wait long for a drink. But I do have a warning to any wine lovers out there. Princess is one of the worst selections of wine by the glass at sea. Their wine bar is a good selection, but you can't order any of those wines anywhere else in the ship. If you order wine by color or just varietal and you don't care where it comes from, then you're fine. But if you have preferences in terms of geography or style when you're having lunch or dinner in the main dining room, like a Sauvignon Blanc from New Zealand, which is pretty standard, or an Oki Chardonnay from California, also very standard, you're out of luck. So this is the main dining room wine list. If you're in the classic drink package, they won't even tell you what you're getting other than the varietal. Prosecco, Pinot Grigio, Riesling. Okay. If you have the premier drink package, you've got 10 options. 
On other cruise lines, you usually have at least double that. My local pub across the street here in Ottawa has a better wine list than this. Obviously, it's a first world problem, but something that is disappointing if you've paid extra for the premier drink package. I was on a Norwegian ship last year with a similar package and we could get glasses of Veuve Clicquot anywhere on the ship and bottles of wine like Moet were included in any dining room. If you're a wine lover, please subscribe to my channel and watch out for my next video where I'll compare wine selection among all of the major cruise lines, which should be fun. Beer and cocktail lovers have absolutely nothing to worry about since every bar is seen very well stocked in those categories. Check out my blog for drink menus from bars across the ship, including their cocktail bar Good Spirits. Okay, let's talk amenities, which is a major strength for Princess. There are more than enough indoor and outdoor pools, hot tubs, and places to relax throughout the ship. The outdoor hot tubs were a great way to relax while enjoying the stunning Alaskan landscape. One thing I really like about Princess is that they have small tables in between each pair of lounge chairs to space things out and give you a place to put your drink and device or book. The Enclave, their fantastic thermal suite located by the spa, is amazing. It includes a hydrotherapy pool, various temperature rain showers with aromatherapy, two steam rooms, a dry sauna, and several heated loungers. What more could you ask for? There is a fee of $150 a week to use the Enclave, or you can get a day pass for $50. This is a must-see for my fellow chill cruisers. Like on other Princess ships, but not all other cruise lines, most decks have a laundry room, which can come in handy if you want to clean or press clothes faster and cheaper than doing it through the ship. You can use your medallion to pay for detergent and machine tokens. Moving on to entertainment, which is becoming less of a standout for Princess. There was a good variety of activities throughout the cruise, including indoor and outdoor movies, trivia, and game shows. There were also several bands and musicians performing throughout the evenings, but it did feel a bit sedate most nights. I've had more fun on Holland America cruises than I did most nights on this ship. They went all in on trivia, game shows, and magic shows, and left out any fun theme nights or silent discos. They did a short Love Boat disco event one night, but it was over in a few minutes. Princess has actually eliminated the disco from its Royal Class ships, starting with Majestic, so they struggle with having a good venue for dancing the night away. When I moved to Ottawa a few months ago, a few friends joked that it was the city where fun goes to die, and sometimes it feels like that's where Princess is headed. On this cruise, they used the piazza for the disco every night, which I don't think worked very well. But the Majestic Orchestra was always a treat to experience when they performed in the piazza and in the main stage shows. The first production show called Encore had a random set of opera and pop songs featuring their guest soprano, Alina Moon, who had an incredible voice. I didn't like or recognize a lot of the songs, and I still don't understand why they were chosen, but the show was still a treat to watch. On the fifth night, Alina sang Broadway hits with the orchestra, and it was truly spectacular. She sang several songs from Phantom of the Opera with another guest entertainer named Nathan Pham, and it was just like you were watching it on Broadway, if not better. The other production show, Sweet Soul Music, had a much clearer Motown theme, and was fun, but it seemed to be a scaled-back version of the same show I saw in Regal Princess a few months ago, which had a lot more energy. They also waited until the last night to stage it, which seemed odd. One of the things I loved about my first Princess Cruise a few years ago was their incredible production shows, complete with elaborate sets and pyrotechnics, including this one called Fiera. They were by far the best shows I had ever seen at sea. Unfortunately, just like the food, they've cut the portion sizes of their production shows as well, and seem way more interested in opera for some reason. If you sit in the first couple of rows of the theatre, you can see that they still have the sets for shows like Fiera hanging above the stage, so I'm crossing my fingers that they might come back. You can find the event listings for every day of the cruise on my blog. Let's talk technology, which has become a princess strength with their medallion concept. Internet was very slow for the entire cruise, but it never dropped out entirely like on my last cruise to Alaska several years ago. You can use the princess app to order food, check event listings, book shore excursions, and see where the other members of your group are located on the ship. You can also message other guests without a fee, although you won't get alerts when someone invites you to connect or sends you a new message. Moving on to the casino, one of my favorite parts of any ship. This particular cruise's itinerary meant that the casino wasn't open as much as it usually is, but there's a good selection of newer slot machines and tables, which were hopping every night. The medallion makes it almost too easy to gamble and charge your room account, which wasn't a good thing this cruise because I wasn't feeling any love from the slots most of the time. For a full rundown of the casino hours, machines, and table limits, check out this video. Last but definitely not least is service. Overall, the crew was fantastic. Ironically, where I was disappointed was whenever I tried to interact with guest services, there was a massive lineup every time I went the first few days. I went early in the morning on the third day and there was no lineup, but there were three guest services people 
all on the phone or doing paperwork and they completely ignored me for a full five minutes, so I gave up. We were supposed to cruise down Endicott Arm on day four to see the Dog Glacier, but it was canceled because of a medical emergency. Cruising by glacier is usually one of the highlights of any Alaska cruise, so this was a big disappointment. Port cancellations and itinerary changes come with the territory for cruising, but I was surprised that the ship didn't try to make up for it with something as simple as a letter on other ways to see glaciers at other ports we were calling on, or a seminar with pictures and video from past visits to the glacier we missed. Especially since Princess has this reputation for being one of the best cruise lines to experience Alaska. Nope, we just woke up to an announcement from the captain that the glacier was canceled, and that was the last we heard of it. Overall, Majestic is a great physical ship, it's just unfortunate that Princess seems to have lost its way when it comes to the customer experience on board. How else to explain not saying a word to guests in Vancouver when the ship was five hours late? Or when they eliminated traditional dining without any apparent programs to address the implications of such a major change? Norwegian eliminated traditional dining too, but they didn't just force guests to fend for themselves in a busy dining room. They have screens throughout the ship showing wait times, and after you check in with the host, you get a beeper and can enjoy a drink while you wait. I was on a full Norwegian ship with 4,000 people last November, and we never waited more than two minutes to get a table at a restaurant the entire week. And there were definitely a few wow meals on that cruise, like this beef tenderloin dish from their French restaurant. It was so good. Considering the demographics of the last couple of princess cruises I've been on, I don't even really understand why they eliminated traditional dining in the first place. All the lineups really did put a damper on my vacation. It was tough to go from one extreme to the other every day of the cruise. Fast room service breakfast, relaxing morning in the hydrotherapy pool, but then hours of lineups to get on and off the ship, get noodles for afternoon snack, and again to get a table for dinner where I couldn't get the wine I liked, all the while constantly getting lost. Not a very chill friendly experience at all. I had a much better time when I sailed a similar itinerary with Celebrity out of Seattle a few years ago, and of the 33 cruises I've taken, this one ranks one of my least favorites. But Princess seems to be leaning on value these days, so if you're traveling in a large group and don't mind lining up a lot, you can probably save a lot of money cruising Princess versus the other lines. Just pack a lot of patience. All right, that's a wrap for this review. Let me know what you think. There's a lot more intel on the way, including what I learned about travel insurance after missing my ship for the first time a few months ago, cabin upgrade bid programs, casino perks, and much, much more. If any of those topics interest you, please subscribe so you don't miss any valuable tips. Thank you for watching and happy cruising.